wealth, tremendous wealth through their labor. And everything from their labor, all that they had earned, all that they had made, went to people who owned them. So what we need to understand is this cumulative nature of disadvantage that we see today. It's cumulative nature of disadvantage. So the present day racism was built on this long history of racially distributed resources and ideas that shape our view of ourselves, of others, our country. Racism has historically been and continues to be a major part of the American socio-political system. We see that all everywhere we look. All we have to do is watch the news, look on social media, listen to the radio. As, um, as sessions in this series have shown, racism is both overt and covert, and it comes in many forms, these interrelated forms of systemic racism uh, that I'll talk a bit about. There's institutional racism where racist practices have been institutionalized in law and individual racism. I think everyone's probably familiar with individual racism. This is often what people think of when they think of racism, that these uh, individual overt acts that cause death, that cause industry, in, in injury, that cause destruction of property or denial of services or opportunities. So racism is often thought of individual acts of biases. So while of course this discrimination is very much a reality, if we were to only focus on individual racism, then we're gonna obscure the realities that create and maintain racial inequality more broadly. And so that gets us to understanding systemic racism and institutional racism and understanding that systemic racism is built into every level of our society. And institutionalized racism, as a legacy of racial segregation and discrimination that had been legitimated after the Civil War, particularly in the Southern US states with Jim Crow laws. These are these so-called separate but equal laws uh, that were finally struck down in the 1954 US Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Board of Education. As a result of institutional racism, of racial stratification and disparities, we see that in, for example, employment, or in the education system, or in the criminal justice system, in healthcare, in government, name a sector, you'll find it. I'm, for the purposes of today, I'll, I'll focus on housing. So back in the 1930s, the U.S. government sought to make mortgages more affordable. It was it's trying to um, encourage home ownership. And there was a government agency that was called the Home Owners Loan Association. And what this loan, the loan corporation, excuse me, this loan corporation did was it ranked neighborhoods and it ranked neighborhoods all around the country in determining whether a neighborhood was worthy of mortgage lending. Those neighborhoods that received High marks were, were marked uh, typically in blue, uh, those a little less so in green. Borderline neighborhoods were yellow and uh, neighborhoods that were declared not worthy or risky were uh, there in red. And here you see, this is an image of Memphis that we have of, of that practice. It'll probably surprise none of us that the high rank neighborhoods were all white neighborhoods. Generally, those red neighborhoods were majority minority neighborhoods. This practice was called redlining. So this government practice, redlining, was also then swiftly adopted by private banks that also had mortgages. Uh, and this visual language then also became a verb to redline a neighborhood meant to cut it off from essential capital. What this effectively did is it barred black people and other minorities from sharing in the American dream of home ownership and thus preventing them from building wealth like their white counterparts. So this spatial segregation and isolation are key features of this racial inequality in our society. It's, it's important to understand that that segregation was constructed. It was deliberately constructed and imposed through various public and private practices like we see with redlining. 
So housing was a tool then to suppress black wealth, not build it like it was for white Americans. So this institutionalized racism that we're seeing here, for example, on this map, influenced decisions about land use, about the enforcement of environmental regulations, where industrial facilities are placed, uh, the management of economic vulnerability, where highways are built, and a lot of times for people of color, where they were able to have choices to play, to, to live, work, and play. So the environmental hazards that we're gonna talk about with these issues of environmental justice, these concerns of environmental racism, can be traced back to these patterns of residential segregation and then the resulting structural inequalities that came from that. People of color were victims, still today, of land use decisions that mirror the power arrangements of the dominant white society. We see this through zoning laws, for example, through regulation of urban land use, be that residential, commercial, or industrial. In 1987, there was this landmark study that was done by the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. And that study uh, found in its toxic waste and race in the United States, found that race was the most important variable for predicting where commercial hazardous waste facilities were gonna be located. It was a more powerful uh, indicator than household income. So it wasn't a question of class or income, it was a question of race. And the report found that there's clear evidence that minorities bear a disproportionate share of environmental risk and death and have less power to protect themselves. So race is an independent factor. It's an independent factor in the prediction of the distribution of air pollution, of contaminated fish consumption, where landfills and incinerators are located, the location of abandoned toxic waste dumps, and lead poisoning in children. Race is an independent factor in all of that. In response, we see the development of the environmental justice movement. This sprung up mainly in urban centers of America and was led largely by women of color. For the environmental justice movement, the environment is considered something more broadly than just nature. The environment is where we, where we live, where we work, where we play, and where we learn. A lot of environmental justice activists uh, traced their beginnings back to 1982, when the state of North Carolina decided to build uh, a toxic waste dump, a PCP dump in Warren County. Warren County at that time was 75% African American. And that issue was, is that the EPA allowed, oh, pardon me, allowed officials to uh, construct this dump that would be uh, only seven feet, the waste would only be seven feet above the water table. Normally, the minimum required is 50 feet. So there, of course there was outrage. There was outrage, some 16,000 residents, organized marches and protests. This was led largely by church leaders. They lost the battle. The state opened a dump. Chemicals had been leaching into the soil, but their actions did help spark the environmental justice movement in the U.S. Academics have been uh, behind this movement, gathering data, uh, showing that yes, indeed, there is such a thing as environmental racism. Dr. Robert Bouillard is one of the leading academics in this. His groundbreaking book, uh, Dumping in Dixie, talked about race, class, and environmental quality. Beverly Wright, another leading academic, uh, has discussed issues of environmental racism uh, in our communities, especially here in the South. What they are finding, what these academics have found, is what a lot of us already know, especially those of us who live with it, that environmental hazards are uh, inequitably distributed, distributed throughout the United States. That environmental problems bear disproportionately down on the poor and on communities of color. For a time, there was a tension between what we might call traditional environmental groups, traditional environmentalism like the Sierra Club, which tended to focus on protecting the earth, protecting nature, rather than 
humans who inhabit it. And for a time, those mainstream environmental movements uh, hadn't sufficiently addressed the fact that social inequality, social inequality and the imbalance of social power are at the heart of environmental degradation. So that is to say, we can't solve the environmental crisis without effectively addressing social justice and environmental justice issues. Uh, today, it's important to note that the Sierra Club has embraced, or most of its chapters have embraced, environmental justice issues. Uh, it's probably something that Ms. Bradshaw might speak about uh, when she comes to talk. So just uh, some figures to understand the vulnerabilities of minorities of communities of color when it comes to issues of environmental quality and linking those to issues of social justice, pop percentage of population located near toxic waste dumps that are communities of color, uh, their claims being denied by the EPA, having exposure to dangerous pollutants. That report, that initial report, the toxic waste and race, uh, at, came out again 20 years later to see if any progress had been made. Uh, and what it found is that significant racial and social economic uh, disparities persist. Persist. There had been some change, but but very little. Uh, the distribution of the nation's commercial hazardous waste facilities still remain tied to communities of color, impoverished communities. There is clear evidence. There's clear evidence of racism uh, where toxic wastes are situated and are located and how government responds to toxic contamination. So many of the communities not only still face the same problems that they did 20 years during that first report, but now they face new ones because of government cutbacks and enforcement, weakening of health protection mandates, and the dismantling of the environmental justice regulatory apparatus. So in the end, we can still say that race matters when it comes to talking about environmental pollutants and issues of uh, environmental justice. And I'll, I'll end my talk there, I'll stop my screen share. Uh, thank you all very much, and I look forward to uh, hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Keller, for that eye-opening presentation on the history of environmental racism in the U.S. Your presentation was very informative and helps lay the foundation for our next speaker, Ms. Latricia Adams, who I will now briefly introduce. Ms. Adams is a proud Memphis native. She is the founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint, a grassroots environmental justice and civil rights organization taking action and advocating against the lead exposure within African American and Latino communities. She was also the past president for the Memphis Urban League Young Professionals and Thursday Network, where under her leadership, the chapter won two major awards for service and excellence. Currently, Ms. Adams holds the position of Manager of Organizational Quality for Shelby County Schools Office of Charter Schools in Memphis, Tennessee. Ms. Adams has been recognized as a leader numerous times through awards such as Unbossed and Unapologetic Visionary Award at the inaugural Black Millennial Political Convention in 2018 and the Women's Information Network Young Woman of Achievement Award for Service Beyond Measure. Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Adams. We are lucky to have you. The floor is all yours. Thank you. That was such a lengthy bio. I definitely could have cut that short. Uh, thank you for your, um, your warm introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward with sharing my screen. Uh, thank you to everyone who is joining us um, this afternoon. Um, I'm looking forward to just sharing some of the work that we do. I think that you were absolutely right to say um, that this was a, a perfect segue um, to talk about the environmental justice movement um, as it relates to today. Um, so I'm going to talk about environmental justice through the lens of um, the new Jim Crow. Um, as many of us are familiar with, especially those who um, either are from the South or currently reside in the South, um, the new Jim Crow 
or Jim Crow in general speaks to segregation. Um, it speaks to the American version of apartheid. And what we see, um, especially as it relates to um, environmental justice, that we see some of the same disparities that are based on racial discrimination. So just to give you a little bit of background of who we are, um, so Black Millennials for Flint was birthed um, from the Flint water crisis. Um, it actually was established from a small group, just three women, three Black women, um, who was angry um, and very frustrated with what was taking place in Flint, but not just in Flint, Michigan, but in cities and, and states um, across, the, across the country. Um, so we are a fairly new um, and, and young, um, pun intended, organization um, that solely focuses on environmental justice with a specific interest in the eradication of lead. Um, we have four key cities that we work with, and you'll notice a recurring theme. So we work with Baltimore, Maryland, um, and our namesake, Flint, Michigan, Memphis, Tennessee, as well as Washington, D.C. Those four cities mark some key issues around environmental justice, specifically as it relates to lead that varies from lead in water, as well as lead-based paint and housing. So today I'm gonna focus on three things. We're gonna um, focus and narrow in on the national lead crisis and then speak a little bit about climate racism and then end with some opportunities for hope. I always like to end with um, a call to action um, just to engage everyone that this is our democracy and we do have power together collectively to create a world that we, we wish to see. So first, just framing how lead shows up in our environment, while oftentimes, even within the environmental justice realm, we focus a lot on water, on um, lead and water, as well as lead and housing, which typically comes from lead-based paint. But there are other mechanisms in which you see lead manifest. So the first one is in soil and then also in consumer products. So when I say consumer products, that includes a lot of um, times imported goods. So that can be, for example, cheap toys that you may see at a dollar store. When you talk about uh, racial discrimination and systemic oppression, just think in your mind, where do you frequently see those discount dollar stores? So oftentimes with toys, um, they're extremely detrimental to small children, being that children oftentimes put things in their mouths. You also see lead sometimes in imported items, consumer products with ceramics. Um, so that can be bowls, it can be mugs. Oftentimes um, it comes from lead-based paint that are used on those items. Just a quick fact about lead in particular, lead helps paint and colors pop. It makes color very vibrant. And then another common item where you see lead present um, is in beauty products. So beauty products such as eyeliners, mascara, lipsticks, um, and some instances do have um, traces of lead which is, of course, very dangerous um, as it relates to contact with humans, with people. And um, unlike things that you see with housing and water and even with soil, regulations as it relates to consumer products are, in some instances, non-existent, especially when you think about items that are imported into the country. They are not met with the same level of scrutiny um, because they're not domestic. So shifting gears a little bit, um, I want to talk about climate apartheid. I used that phrase or that word a little bit earlier. So right now, um, we see it um, across our TV screens. We are hearing a lot about climate and the climate crisis. Um, living in the South, um, I can definitely attest to how climate detrimentally and disproportionately impacts communities of color. 
um, it impacts all of us. But when you start to peel away the layers, um, when you think about systemic racism um, and just elements of white supremacy, you see how black and brown communities are especially impacted. Um, so the definition of climate apartheid is really straightforward, um, but I wanna break it down just a bit. So for example, um, as we start to see things, and this ties into the other definition of climate gentrification, we see historically black and brown neighborhoods no longer being black and brown anymore. Um, so we see gentrification here in Memphis. We see gentrification in DC, which was once um, dearingly and dearingly called Chocolate City, which is now um, from a a, a humorous perspective, but also a little bit sad, where it's now called Mocha City because of all of the gentrification that has occurred within the last 15 years or so. As it relates to climate apartheid and climate gentrification, essentially those people who are more affluent, um, people who um, have participated in white flight, move to areas where they are not as directly impacted by issues surrounding climate. Now, again, I mentioned that climate impacts all of us, but when you think about the after effects of climate, for example, Hurricane Katrina and many of the other hurricanes that have come after that time that have wreaked havoc um, in urban um, cities, which we know are typically inhabited by black and brown people, people who have affluence and have financial economic access move into areas where they're not directly impacted. Now, here is the caveat. What people have found over time, specifically with developers, is that some of the areas that were historically black and brown neighborhoods oftentimes um, are not as directly impacted by climate issues such as um, extreme weather. And so that's where you start to see spikes in property values where people are actually um, forced out of communities that they help to build for generations. Um, so when we talk about climate and just environmental justice issues in general, I liked um, how the doctor that preceded me talked about not just the focus on restoration and saving the earth for earth's sake, but saving it because we want to make sure that the people who live in it are actually able to live abundantly and healthily. So when you tie in issues surrounding climate, Compared to the current issues surrounding COVID-19, it, for lack of better words, and it sounds a bit morbid, is a death wish. Um, where when you even think about the fundamentals of how we're having to navigate through life um, with extreme heat, especially in the South, we're also starting to see heat waves in areas of the country that are not accustomed to such extreme heat, um, having to wear masks thinking about same types of environmental justice issues that impact air pollution and has caused asthma, whether it be adult asthma or childhood asthma, making it really difficult to just simply breathe. Um, so when we talk about environmental justice, um, it's really important that we talk about the people and not necessarily just focus on the, the concepts that are associated with it um, but making sure that there's a clear understanding of how um, racism plays a huge role in the way in which we operate in all forms of life, and that includes the way that we live and share the planet. The next thing that I want to touch on, and it does include aspects of climate, is the impact of climate and Black maternal health. So a bit earlier this month, New York Times released a pretty devastating article that talked about the connection between climate change and pregnancy risks, particularly as it relates to African American women. So within this study, it found that out of all women examined, um, including those of other minority groups, Black women were the most detrimentally impacted. So for example, when you think about the environmental justice aspect, think about 
where the majority of Black women live throughout the country, um, thinking about those environmental hazards that oftentimes um, negatively impact um, housing accessibility, um, those negative impacts around water quality, all of those different things that essentially attribute to what's called body burden um, are carried the heaviest among Black women. And so in addition to there being societal injustices as it relates to the treatment of Black women as it relates to maternal health and reproductive health, you're now talking about climate issues impacting Black motherhood. You're also talking about water quality impacting Black motherhood, exposure to lead. Um, you're also talking about air pollution making it hard to breathe. Taking it a step further, in our current time, um, with the civil unrest that's occurring within the city, where you have Black women, um, and of course allies as well, who are on the front lines marching and protesting for equity and criminal justice reform, you now talk about in some instances in some cities where people are using tear gas and other things to torment crowds that also exacerbate um, health issues that are pervasive to everyone, but particular to um, Black women, those who are with child or those who are planning um, to, to have a family. So it's really important, if I don't have anything else for folks to take away, is to understand how elements of racism and white supremacy coalesce and create these systems of oppression that makes it really difficult to um, break those barriers apart. The last part that I want to um, end with is there are aspects of hope. Um, oftentimes when we talk about environmental justice issues, especially as it relates to environmental racism, it's a really sensitive topic. Um, and personally, as, as a Black woman, it oftentimes can become very exhausting um, to be directly impacted by those injustices, but then also um, taking leadership and accountability for my community to ensure that we are forever striving for equity and just a better world for all of us to exist regardless of race, um, ethnicity, culture, creed, so on and so on. So part of the work that Black Millennials for Flint does, in addition to providing educational awareness, where our focus is specifically on um, the Black and Brown community, we also work very strategically hand in hand with our allies. We also work directly with legislators. It's very important for Black and Brown people to have access to the table um, with decision makers. So opportunities for advocacy, um, whether you are, whether if you are a person of color or if you're an ally, is to make sure that there is space and representation as it involves um, engagement with local, state, and federal elected officials, but then taking it a step further with working collaboratively to ensure that even when progressive bills are passed, um, that there are systems of accountability and oversight that's representative of the community. Um, so I'll give you a quick example of some work that we've done here um, in Memphis and Shelby County. Um, I am actually the inaugural chair for what's called the Shelby County Lead Prevention and Sustainability Commission, which was established in tandem with um, Mayor Lee Harris, the mayor of Shelby County. And with this particular commission, it's community-based, and it provides oversight and accountability of our state-mandated lead prevention program which tests for lead and water in schools. There's one thing to make sure that you get bills passed, but the second layer is to make sure that those policies are implemented with fidelity. So when you talk about ways to um, break down these systems of oppression and really create change, it will again take all of us to work collaboratively from a place of advocacy. And then I'll leave with this because I definitely want to make sure that I am respectful to our time as we have an additional speaker. Um, if you have not heard of the Environmental Justice for All Act, please do so. Um, this is a huge bill that was actually introduced at the House by um, Chair Grijalva and um, 
Congressman Don McEachin out of Virginia, where essentially it centers the voices of people of color um, to really be able to orchestrate um, influence to create cleaner and healthier communities which are directly impacted by environmental injustices. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to our wonderful moderator and thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Adams. Your activism with regards to environmental justice is inspiring. I will now introduce our final distinguished speaker, Ms. Marquita Bradshaw. Marquita Bradshaw is a native from Memphis, Tennessee and a founding member of Youth Terminating Pollution. Currently, Ms. Bradshaw is running for the Democratic primary for the US Senate. Her role as an environmentalist and activist is shown through her engagement with several organizations and leadership positions. Ms. Bradshaw is the Environmental Justice Chair for the Tennessee Chapter Sierra Club, board member of African American Environmental Justice Network, active member of Mid-South Peace and Justice Center, and more. She also won the Dick Mochow Environmental Justice Award from the Sierra Club, as well as the Human Rights Award from the Mid-South Peace and Justice Center. Marquita Bradshaw is an advocate for environmental justice, education reform, tax reform, trade policy, and social justice. Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Bradshaw. I will now hand it over to you. Hello, everybody. I hope I am not being redundant. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful that you gave me this opportunity to be here today to share space with you all. Um, Latricia hit on some very important things about what it means to be a Black woman, to live the issues, and also uh, interacting with agencies that affect our lives daily on what, how we receive uh, environmental policy, labor policy, whether it be tax policy, but everything that interacts with our lives and as black women, we experience those things differently with our children and our mates. So I am going to be probably a little redundant uh, because I wanted to focus on, and please let me know when I'm, I've made time. Let me make, let me figure out how to share this screen. Oh, Jesus. We, uh, Share screen and we're going to go here. The definition of an environmental environmental justice is more it's a legal term now because of the work that so many people were able to do, um, like Hazel Johnson and many others across the nation that came together to actually form the environmental justice order that Bill Clinton put in place. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, income, with the respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Can, can you see that? Everything's okay. Meaningful, meaningful involvement means that people have an opportunity to participate in decisions about activities that may affect their environment and or health. The public's contribution can influence the regulatory agency's decisions. Community concerns will be considered in a decision-making process. Decision makers will seek out and facilitate the involvement of those potential affected, and people have self-determination about their community, the types of industries that come into their communities when it comes to their health. I wanted to do a quick slide to illustrate what disparities look like in the state of Tennessee. 
there are, this data may be old because we have not been updating our policy as it comes for, for environmental justice because of this current administration. And a lot of Superfund sites that are active have actually been archived, not because they're safe, but because this is it's not a priority of the current administration, which means that places like Memphis are put in more danger. Can you see the disparities, everyone? Now, look at some of the cities that surround us. 200 compared to 58 in Nashville, Tennessee, Old Hickory, 3, Madison, Ripley. This is the disparities that Black, Brown, Indigenous, and poor whites live across the state of Tennessee. Environmental racism happens in the environment based on ethnicity, race, and class. These are some of the things that people worked on. Bassico and North Memphis, Hollywood Dump. There are local communities that did a lot of work on bringing this issue to the forefront in Memphis. Memphis has a rich history of environmental justice, of grassroots organizations, like the one that my, me and my sister started and my mom started with other community members uh, that were in the Defense Depot area. So this was a 640 acre compound. It operated from 1942 to 1995. It included chemicals like heavy metals, which Latricia hit on. Uh, lead is a heavy metal, uh, and there's no safe threshold for any heavy metal, unlike what the standards say today. A lot of environmental standards need to be updated. The EPA placed the Defense Depot on a Superfund site list in 1992. We lived on the west side <laughs> of the depot, but there were communities on each side of the depot. And the depot was right across the street from my elementary school. My mom was a PTA president where she actually received the notice in the mail and she actually took it to the PTA meeting and she was designated to bring back a report on whether or not what was going on at the depot. When she brought back the report, the PTA president was like, look, we need to set up another meeting uh, so we can really deeply discuss this outside of the PTA. That meeting had over 500 people attend from our neighborhood in South Memphis, when it's hard to get 40 people to show up to an event in Memphis. It was 500 people. And that day she was elected the president and they started the organization, DDMT CCC. I didn't get involved until I saw what the chemicals were doing to the reproductive system of children, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, uterine, ovarian, testicular, and prostate cancer. I was a young mom in 1995 and I was experiencing poverty too. But I thought it was unacceptable that because of where I lived, the chemicals not only could affect my body, but be mutagenic where it affects my son, his children, his children's children, 
if they can even have children after a while. That's called gentrification. And within our communities, you see gentrification and that's called genocide when you stop a group of people from being able to reproduce. And so you see my sisters over there to the side. Uh, the way we were able to do our work is that we made alliances with black, brown, indigenous, and people from around the world who were experiencing the same type of pollution, not just military pollution, but pollution period. This is a picture of the surface runoff from the Defense Depot. You can see the water going down into the, this is Crane, Cane Creek. It actually surf, resurfaced right here, goes back up under the ground um, because there's a watershed with, with um, groundwater system that's right up under the depot with all those chemicals and everything. And so we were in a meeting with governmental officials who said that it was the pollution of the community that was actually going up the hill and, and um, contaminating the Defense Depot and that they were not contaminating us. And so we took this picture one day when it was raining. And you can see the water is not going against science up the hill. This is where Cane Creek resurfaces and actually goes under the high school, Hamilton High School in South Memphis. Children have actually been evacuated from the school because they were experiencing health problems. And some have had to go to the hospital in the past. So what type of chem, what type of pollution is actually there? Biological chemical warfare, radioactive contamination, weaponized viruses. So we lived every day once we became aware of what was down the street in a state of how we are living now in a pandemic. With us being that close proximity to weaponized viruses, we always wondered what would happen if to our community, if one of those viruses got loose. The pandemic is not a weaponized virus, but it shows us that our community is even more vulnerable when it comes to a pandemic because we have the pre-existing conditions of poverty and pollution. And you add racism in the mix and our communities die at a higher rate even during COVID-19. Some of the first deaths of COVID for people who had once lived in our community who have moved away and still they are being subject to more death than others. Now, These mounds were all around the depot. This is one of the chemicals that were that's used to build ammunition, just sitting there. And so it depended on what which way the wind blew and what was actually in the air. There was also seven incinerators, German and American mustard gas, and anything that was used in any war during the time that this facility operated. <clears throat> and 
In 2000, Sierra Club actually makes their environmental justice program. And we get an environmental justice organizer in Memphis, which was very helpful. But there are some environmental justice networks that are not here anymore. In my bio, it said I was a board um, a member of the African American Justice Action Network. That organization does not exist anymore. But how it worked was that grassroots communities, we all were board members of this organization in order to be able to have a voice where communities speak for themselves. And as you see, there were a lot of environmental justice networks. Some of them are still here. National Black Environmental Justice Network is still in operation. Southern Organizing Committee is no longer here. The Coalition of Black Trade Unions Community Action Response Against Toxins Team, spelled like carrot like the diamond, is a, a task force built of labor and community to train community members and labor members how to deal with toxins in their communities and their workplace. So we actually, through that alliance, I am has walked HAZMAT, has Walker certified first aid, and we went through classes for, we provided all those classes free for the community. So we can actually be prepared for living down the street from a national priority list Superfund site. And still today, coal ash was something of an East Tennessee problem, but because of our energy needs, it actually grew into a Memphis, Tennessee problem too. And so I tell you all these things to go back to that we are at a crossroad. In the state of Tennessee, because of our current administration has moved away from the gains that were made during the Obama administration when it came to the environment, we are in a dangerous place in the state of Tennessee. And our communities carry a lot of trauma from environmental racism because that means that our family and our friends die at a higher rate than the national rate, than the state rate. I really try not to get emotional even now, but right now I'm taking that trauma and turning it into a triumph because no longer can we sit by and be silent because racism in any American policy kills people. whether it's slowly over time from not being able to eat right or be able to access the medical system or instantaneously when people interact with the police or the environment. Because the environment can have acute and cumulative effects where it can kill people right away or slowly and painfully over time. The triumph comes when we utilize our identities to tell the story that our communities have experienced. I am actually the first ever environmental justice activist ever to run for the US Senate. Usually environmental justice activists like Latricia and others, we work in networks and groups to work with legislators to change policy. But never have we ever been able to even sit at the table at the beginning when they're talking about policies or build the table when it comes to environmental integrity and moving to a much, much just society. I got inspired by 
looking at young people like Latricia, my mother, Greta Thunberg, what young people have been doing around climate justice and how much courage they showed got me to the place where a person that said that I don't want to be in politics. And if I did want to be in politics, I would do federal policy. And so if I did federal policy, I would run for US Senate. I said that in 2018, or was it 20? No, 2019, December 2019 at a Sierra Club Christmas party. And life happens. My mother has complete kidney failure, but not because it's her fault. And then she's responsible for her own medicine from that kidney failure when it's related to the communities that we live in, when it's related to the poverty that we live in. And she was supposed to die. let the doctors say, they said that she was supposed to die June of 2019. Like she had some type of expiration date stamped on her foot. And I looked at her fight and she was my age. And she took on the Department of Defense, one of the most powerful agencies in the world, DLA, Defense Logistic Agency, one of the most powerful agencies of the world. They handle all of our things that keep us safe and secure in this country. And those things also made her sick in our community sick. And so looking at the bravery of all the people put me in a place where that statement I made came to fruition. Words are so powerful, powerful. And what you do today determines what type of legacy we have in our future. My name is Marquita Bradshaw, an environmental justice advocate that grew up in South Memphis. And you can compare that to South LA, South Chicago. And I am a candidate for United States Senate to represent you hardworking people across the United States because we get left out of having healthy and safe communities because people put profit over people. There is a way that we can do both things as we move to a better technology with a green infrastructure. When you grow in your ideologies over time, like I have, it's been 25 years fighting, begging, begging people to represent us. And we don't have time to be sick and tired because we're dying too fast. People have told our stories for us in so many books. They have talked for us. And it's time for us to have a direct line to reflect the issues that we are facing. None of the other candidates were even talking about social justice issues, let alone environmental issues. I was the first one to sign the Green New Deal. The others follow. And now, because we've been driving the issues of this race, they're trying to interweave social justice issues from the lens of attorneys. And attorneys are great. And we have a lot of them at the US Senate level. And we also need an environmental justice advocate at the US Senate level. 
thank you for my for your time. You can go to my website. Let me show it. MarquitaBradshaw.com. Thank you for inviting me. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Ms. Bradshaw, not only for your incredible presentation, but for your hard work and, and vulnerability and for sharing your personal story and your family's history and for your contribution to the community. It's people like you that inspire true change and we're truly grateful for you. Um, so at this time, I would like to open up the floor to questions. Um, with respect to the speaker's time, maybe just a, one or two, if um, someone would like to either send it to the chat box or unmute yourself and ask, please go ahead. Okay, um, I think the presentation was so great. No one has any questions. Um, um, at this time, I'd like to bring this session to a close. Um, I'd like to thank our esteemed guests, Dr. Tate Keller, Ms. Latricia Adams, and Ms. Marquita Bradshaw for helping us understand the past and present state of environmental justice in the US. You guys have been incredibly generous with your time and your preparation. So thank you so much once again. A big thank you to everyone who attended this webinar for actively educating yourself and your community. We hope you will join us for our next webinar titled Educational Inequalities, which will be held this Friday at 4 p.m. You can also follow us on Instagram at Serving Bluff City and on Facebook at Memphis College Service Coalition. Thank you once again and have a great evening.